year, last year, when we were talking about Russian bees. And I was so impressed with his operation that I thought having him come back and talk about his honey show here and in um, Mississippi and Arkansas. Mississippi. Yeah, Mississippi. 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 I got too many states here going on today. He's in Alabama and Mississippi. He runs a, a big operation, and you're going to learn a lot. Keep playing. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. I appreciate you inviting me. Um, one thing that you probably didn't know when you did invite me is that when I was here last year, I was working with my father's operation, which is Coy's Honey Farm, and uh, I no longer work. I'm no longer part of that operation, so I have my own Coy Bee Company, and uh, I stay in Mississippi. My dad's operation runs from Arkansas. It's a kind of a migratory thing from Arkansas to Mississippi. Uh, so Kim wanted me to talk about making honey in southeast United States. So the secret to making huge honey crops in the southeast United States. So questions, and I'm kind of like Randy Oliver, ever just slightly, okay? Don't get scared, <laughs> slightly. And that <clears throat> this is the first time I've given this talk and I, complete, I constantly reorder the slides. Um, so sometimes I get surprised. So questions, questions that you need to be, oh, wait, let me think here. Okay, John gave an excellent talk this morning, didn't he? Let's all give him, give him a round of applause. Uh, and, and so did Andy. So did Andy. And, and I want, uh, want you all to see if you can find similarities between some of the core things that they said and some of the things that I'm going to say, because I, could, I recognize commonalities uh, with those. Take notes of questions, and if you have questions as I go along, you can raise your hand and then ask me afterwards, because I, I hope there'll be time for questions. Okay, so questions to think about. <clears throat> what will you do with the honey? So I know yesterday most of y'all are um, uh, backyard beekeepers, hobby beekeepers. Uh, but if you, want to, if you want to grow to the sideline status or even to the uh, industrial size, you need to know what are you going to do with your honey? You're going to wholesale it in restaurants and grocery stores. You're going to sell it from your house. You're going to sell it out of the trunk of your car at work. You're going to sell it at church. You want to bottle enough to sell to the farmer's markets. Or are you going to sell it in drums, sell it to packers? Um, you need to know what your, set your goal so you need to know how hard you're going to have to work to reach that. Um, are you going to go to almonds? Are you going to get once you get several hives, um, are you going to are you are you going to be able to send them? To, are you going to be willing to send them to almonds? And if you do that, how is their return going to affect uh, your splitting schedule when they come back in the spring? And is it going to affect your honey production? Because it might. How far are you willing to have your bees from your house? Are you willing to keep them 30 to 60 miles from your house? 100 miles? 300 miles. How far is it, John? How far is your two operations? Six, you ready? To, are you willing to go 1,600 miles to keep your bees? If you're not, then then that might that might affect uh, that might affect how much honey you, you you can make. And probably the most important is, do you live in a high honey production area? So if you don't know this already, that's probably one of the first things you need to find out. How do how does your and if you do have, you have hives now, how does your hive production compare to the total production from your state and your neighbors and your, and your region of your state? And which part of, the, of your state makes the biggest honey crops? So here's the big six. Usually they say the big four, but the big six states from gross honey production statewide and also numbers of colonies. As you can see, uh, California and Florida, they make, uh, uh, okay, so the chart on the, on your right here is, or on your left, uh, is pounds per hive. Where's it? We have a clicker. Hey, Mich Michelle, do you have your click, your pointer? Okay. So, so California makes 33 pounds per hive on average. Minnesota 50, 58. No, uh, Montana 94. North Dakota was at 69. Uh, the those four states of it, but in the north. Uh, Montana, North, South Dakota, and uh, Minnesota, half of the bees in the United States are there in the summertime. And so they make a, even, even though they, they're making 69 pounds per hive in North Dakota, 
the state makes the most honey. I don't remember the value. The state makes more honey than any other state in the nation. Okay, but we're not talking about those guys. We're talking about southeast. Um, so that's, and I'm lim pretty much limiting it to, ah, uh, okay. To uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, um, South Carolina, North Carolina. So how many people here are from any of these states? All right, good. Um, so you see um, Alabama's making 52 pounds per hive. Uh, this is the NAS data from 2015, so it's, it's actually two, year, two years old data. Uh, South Carolina makes more than zero pounds per hive. They don't, they don't, uh, NAS lumps them with about five other states, so I don't really have any idea how much the average production is in that state. Uh, but you see Louisiana, Mississippi, right there around 100 pounds per hive. Now, this is an average, and you can do a lot with statistics, uh, and I think that one of the reasons that, that Mississippi's is so high is there are a few beekeepers that keep bees here, and then they move the bees up here, and so they make, they make a good crop here and they make a good crop there. So they're double cropping their bees and they're making, uh, that skews the average because in uh, this section of the state, there's not a lot of honey production and in this section of the state, there's not much honey production. Okay, so there are no secrets to making a big honey crop. That's the secret. It takes good decisions and good locations. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about a couple of key issues that are, I have more than four pillars, like John did. I think there's about seven. But So first, we, you need to start with good bee management. You need to become a beekeeper, not a bee haver. So you need to start in the fall preparing for next year's honey crop. So this is the time of year that you need to start. All right, let me, let me Back up for I'm going to talk mostly about South Mississippi honey production. And when I talk about what you need to do, if I use dates, they are specific to South Mississippi, which we had this discussion yesterday. I, I don't like it when someone says, you, like Dennis, you need to treat for mites in August. Now, I don't need to treat for mites in August. I have dead hives in August if you don't treat in South Mississippi. You need to treat for mites in June. Uh, so. The, the month is not as important as what stage of the life cycle your, your hive is in. Okay, so the fall, this is the time that you want to start working for next year's honey crop. You want to build your winter bees now because they're the ones that's going to get you uh, started in the spring. And more hives you have in the fall, the more hives that survive the winter, is the more, more honey you're going to have in the springtime. <clears throat> so one of the things you might need to consider is how much honey do they make in the fall? Do they make enough for you to pull the excess off? Is it worth it to pull it and replace it with corn syrup? Or you may be better off just to leave it on there uh, and let them live through the winter because, because mother nature is best. While uh, John and Andy feed a lot uh, to get their bees up, you know, I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, what mother nature provides is, is better than what we can give them. Uh, your fall season is obviously going to be different than mine, even, even in the southeast. Uh, from north, north to south Mississippi is, I don't know, 400, it's about 400 miles. So there's a lot of, there's a, a big variation in the plants that bloom and the time that they bloom. Uh, about every 60 to 80 miles north or south you travel, you're going to get a one week's variation in plant bloom and colony build up or slow down in the fall. So in uh, the northern tier of the southern U.S., Tennessee, North Carolina, northern Arkansas, North Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, uh, their fall management is going to take place from September through October. Uh, when you get down to the coastal areas of Louisiana and Alabama and Georgia, uh, it's going to be more like mid-October to mid-November. So just because fall management is not, it's not, it's not a date thing, it's more of a, a regional. Uh, one of the things you need to do is you need to measure your mite loads uh, and you need to treat if necessary. <clears throat> and you need to measure the mites. You, you don't need to guess on how many mites you have. Uh, you need to remove your excess supers. Don't leave a lot of supers stacked up in the wintertime. Uh, you need to be sure to remove your excluders. If you run excluders, remove those. 
and, and let the let the bees come up in the in the winter, uh, feed on the the honey. Uh, because you can get it can get cold. It does freeze down there even in in Wiggins, Mississippi, and uh, sometime I mean it got 17 degrees a couple for several nights a couple years ago. So if you leave that excluder on and your queen gets stuck below that excluder, the cluster can get above her and she you, she could freeze. Uh, you don't need to leave excess boxes on because that that in, interferes with small hive beetle control. Uh, uh, you you want to take the boxes off so you can conserve the heat en heat energy and reduce my mice damage. <coughs> you want to feed if necessary. Uh, you need to feed thick syrup in the fall. If, if you're going to feed sugar, you need to feed two two pounds of sugar to one pound of water, or you need to feed corn syrup. Feed the thick corn syrup. Pollen patties. I don't I don't have I have very little experience with pollen patties because I haven't used them. I haven't seen that much of a, a benefit from them in my situation. But you can choose which is the best ones to use for you. You need to know your average monthly rainfall, especially in the wintertime. And you need to know your general soil types in your area, partly so that you can help pick your, your uh, locations for identifying plant locations. But also you need to know how wet it's going to be when it rains. Uh, because this is going to affect your ability to access your hives in the fall. Now these are pictures from, Baker, from I think it's from Bakersfield, California area, but the same principle applies. Uh, if it's a little bit wet, it can be a little bit difficult, and it's hard to see, but this is a, a Hummer, uh, and it has dual wheels on it. They do not make them with dual wheels. This is a special order thing, and it requires a special order uh, trailer to go with them. Uh, but this, this guy had to put dual wheels on his um, swinger, I call them swingers, they were originally swinger, uh, and they were, they were loading the 18 wheeler to go to almonds, but the tractor, the 18 wheeler tractor couldn't get in there, so they had to go to a real tractor to get their bees out. So knowing, knowing where, uh, what the weather's going to be like, uh, you don't want to, if you know it's going to rain, you know you have a hard time getting there, you want to make sure you go f take care of those yards first. In your dry locations, you can take care of those later. So moving over into winter management, <clears throat> you want to make sure you have plenty of food for the winter. Uh, again, sugar syrup, you can feed it two to one or three to one. It's, it's really difficult to get a three to one ratio of sugar. You've got to have hot water when you do that. Uh, you can feed the inverted corn syrup or the high fructose corn syrup. If you buy that straight, you need to add at least 10% water, mix it up really well so it doesn't solidify, crystallize on you because it doesn't pump well when it's a solid. Trust me. Uh, candy boards, they're not typically used in the south. I think a lot of people use them further north. I, I don't know that they won't work in the, in the southern regions. Uh, they probably will, uh, but I have no experience with them. <coughs> Pollen patties, again, in the winter you can, you can de uh, decide what works for you. Uh, you. Don't forget about small hive beetles because they are, pollen patties, regardless of the brand, is very excellent at growing small hive beetles. <clears throat> um, and it's, it's difficult to stimulate brood rearing uh, until after the winter solstice, which is usually sometime around the 21st of December, uh, regardless of whether you put pollen patties or feed. or it's, just, it's not impossible to do, but it's hard to do. I think it's actually easier to maintain brood rearing if you can get started sometime around Thanksgiving, uh, if you think that's necessary. But if, you, if you're up until the end of, or if you're in the middle of December, and you decide you need to feed, stimulate your bees, it's going to be tough to get them going until after the, the winter solstice. Uh, one of the most important things you can do in the winter is build and repair your equipment uh, because you do have to have something to do, keep you busy, but um, uh, build and repair your equipment. Get it ready for spring. You've got to decide how you're going to make up your splits, what your process is going to be. Uh, some guys save back frames of honey and they put a frame of honey, and they put some, some frames of foundation and some empty combs, they have a feeder, they put that all in the box, they nail the bottom board on, they got a top on there, so, and they got that on the pallet. So when it comes time to make their splits in the spring, they just go get their pallet full of boxes that are ready, and they take it with them to the bee yard. They're not trying to get out there two days before they're making splits and put all this stuff together. Uh, you need a, a two, deep, two deeps, is what most people use. Uh, a, a deep and a medium, a, a nine and five eighths and a six and five eighths work really, they will work well. 
Uh, but you need about 50 pounds of honey to go through the winter until they'll have enough honey to build up in the spring. All right, so the average frost dates. So I've got two charts here. Where did I? I just Googled average frost dates in the southeast. And so you have the zones, and here I, 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 I live here. My dad's operation, we, he runs bees from between here and Arkansas. And we're right on the edge of the number nine zone here, which the lowest temperatures are 20 to 30 degrees, and is the last frost is March, early March. Up here, it's uh, 10 to 20 degrees, and it's uh, early April, I'm sorry. Zero to 10 in late April. Uh, so it can, it, it can we, in Craighead County, there's average of one inch of snow per year. Uh, we actually had a blizzard on Christmas Day about four years ago. We met blizzard conditions right there. It was kind of cold. <laughs> it wasn't real impressive as far as blizzards go, so, I, and I was glad. Okay, so here, um, I can't remember the website I got this from. It's a, a gardening place, but uh, in Jonesboro, 90%, nine times out of 10, you're gonna get 36 degrees on March the 29th. You're gonna get freezing temperature on March the 15th. 50% uh, April 10th. So I know, I know from past experience, if I graphed it on April the 1st, that sometime around April 1st, April 10th, I'm gonna get what we call blackberry winter. It's cold again, and it gets cold enough that it just really screws up your queen cell production. Uh, but it doesn't happen every year, but it happens often enough that you better back, count that it's gonna happen. Uh, in Wiggins, we've got uh, a frost at m on March 8th, nine years out of 10. Uh, it gets down to 28 degrees at the end of January, uh, March the 23rd. Uh, in, in the fall, uh, October 5th is the first uh, killing frost. Uh, down in Wiggins, it's, Oxto it's October 24th. 50% uh, of the time you get, I, I've always said the 15th of April and the 15th of October and the 15th of March and the 15th of November is kind of what I go by. So it's pretty close. But you need to know that so that it will help you uh, make decisions on uh, what you're going to do in the, in the management of your bees. Okay, spring management. Don't let your bees starve in the early spring. So uh, January, February, uh, bees can starve to death pretty quick if you don't keep on top of it. You need to fee feed to stimulate brood rearing and stimulate brood rearing better with sugar water than you can with anything else. Uh, you need to give them room to expand. You need to treat for mites if necessary and you don't know that it's necessary unless you sample for mites. You're gonna have to worry about swarm prevention. You gotta decide, are you gonna split your hives? You're gonna sell brood, you're gonna sell nukes. What are you gonna do to, uh, to, to take care of swarms? Um, and when you feed splits, you need to feed them a one-to-one -one sugar uh, and water. And then you need to add supers for your spring flow. So that's all you have to do to be a good bee manager. Any questions? <laughs> okay, summer, oh, summer management. So you need to pull spring honey if you can. If you make enough honey in the spring, you should pull that honey to make another summer crop. Some places, I know in northwest Arkansas, all they make is spring honey. Um, check mite numbers. Treat if necessary. Now, I know what Dennis said yesterday, but there is no good generic threshold for mite treatments. Three to five is a good starting point, but that doesn't mean that you're locked in to 3% mites or 5% mites. It's different. There's a whole host of things that, that make that different. I'll get into some of those later. If not, ask me questions afterwards. Uh, so in the summer, you gotta add honey supers when they're needed. You pull the, pull the summer honey when, it's, when the flow ends and treat for mites. Now, I didn't say if necessary, I said treat for mites because it will be necessary to treat for mites in the summer. Okay, one of the next things, prob probably close to the single most important thing are good honey locations. And I think, uh, I think Andy and both John alluded to this. Uh, my dad has pretty much always said good locations make good beekeepers. So if if you've got good spots, you can do bad, dumb things and still come out okay. 
So some locations make more honey than others. And if, you, if you'll see, and you know, the picture shows up a lot better on the computer screen. There's a few bees in here. That is by far not full. Uh, it's probably half full, uh, but there's bees and there's honey in that box. That's the top box for that hive. So some locations are better than others. <laughs> some locations are more consistent than others, but some pr consistently produce good crops. So those are nothing, these are Mississippi, these are in Arkansas, that's nothing to sneeze at. My dad's operation uh, the last five years has averaged 100 pounds per hive over the whole operation. That's a 10,000 hive operation between Mississippi and Arkansas. And the state average is 65, I think, for Arkansas. It's 116 for Mississippi. Oh, so this is from the Goddard Space Flight Center, NASA's website. I'd stumbled across. I, I remember seeing this once before, but but so you have the whole United States. You can click. You can click on the state. It'll highlight it, and it'll bring up all of the honey plants from that state listed. Now, everything in yellow. These are these are all plants that produce honey. I can't even read the computer without my glasses. I'm like John. I'm not going to wear them. So you have uh, maple. It is not a significant honey producer. But it blooms in, this is in Mississippi, blooms in uh, January, ends in uh, May. So, um, but it doesn't bloom in January in North Mississippi. Uh, Goddard Space Flight, it's um, honeybeenet.gsf.nasa.gov. Yeah, I, I transposed my numbers too. So it's honeybeenet.gsfc.nasa.gov. I think I just Googled honey plants of Mississippi and found it up. Yeah. Okay, so this lists all the plants in Mississippi. So we have uh, tai tai, buckwheat, uh, or ironwood, gallberry, rat tan vine, white Dutch clover. Uh, leatherwood, tulip poplar, sumac, cotton, soybean. Um, so, and these are all significant honey producers, but that doesn't mean that they all grow in my area because they don't. Uh, I, I actually, there actually is cotton uh, 10 minutes from my shop, but the bees won't make any honey on it. It just has to do with the soils. Um, so just because these things are listed doesn't mean that they are um, uh, going to be growing in your area. And these that have a, that are not listed in yellow, not significant honey plants, that doesn't mean they're not important. So I call those secondary honey plants. And they are very important. So for instance, in Arkansas, in the springtime, there's willow trees. If you can, if you have your bees next to the river, where you get the willow trees, that is excellent uh, plants for bees to build up on. In the fall, we have smartweed in some areas and that is, provides an excellent source of pollen and builds really good winter bees. And a lot of years you can make excess honey off of it. Uh, in South Mississippi, we have tai tai. It builds, it's good for building up bees. If you have really good bees, if you're coming through the winter, you can actually make honey on them f some years. Uh, in the, in the mid-spring, we have yopon holly uh, and, and privet hedge, and those build good bees. They don't usually make any honey off of them, but they'll build bees. And in the fall, we have goldenrod. Sometimes it yields surplus nectar, sometimes not. Uh, Mother Nature's food is always the best. So what makes a good location? What makes a good location? Plants, you gotta have the plants, right? But once you find, the, once you find close to honey plants, you need to have easy access to your roads. You need to have some place you can get to all year long. You need to be able to put your bees close to the road so you don't have to go a quarter mile down the dirt field road. Uh, it's good if there's no vandalism. It's good if they're out of sight of, of homeowners. And you need to be large enough to have large enough areas where you can turn around your, your truck and your forklift. If you're, if you're pulling a trailer with a forklift, you've got to have room to get your equipment in there and turn it around. Uh, you need to have good property owners, someone who's considerate. Landowners or farmers are considerate of, of you and your needs. Uh, consider your bees, someone who is, and you need to have considered pesticide applicators in your area. 
Uh, it might be the best honey production. They might make more honey at that location than they do anywhere else in the state. But if you've got a guy that applies pesticides, really, whether it's a mosquito abatement program or whether it's a farmer, if he, if he has no consideration for your hives and he kills your bees, they're not gonna make a crop. Uh, a few neighbors is better, whether that's your residential neighborhood or whether it's other beekeepers. Uh, uh, Dennis talked about the varroa bombs. If you've got other beekeepers, they may have varroa bombs going off and, and they can affect your hive. Uh, obviously, low pesticide use is good. Uh, you need to generally be within a mile or less of the, of the good forage. You know, bees will travel four or five miles if they have to, but they consume a lot of energy uh, making that trip. Uh, consider the proximity of this location to your other locations. Do I have to drive 30 minutes in the opposite direction to get there? It may be a good honey producer, but it may not be worth the extra time and effort for being, a, that's an hour out of your way, 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back. Uh, spring and summer nectar flows. Um, if you don't move your bees, uh, you need to have both a spring and summer flow um, because bees, bees don't do well in a dearth, pollen dearth. Uh, if it's an early spring flow, uh, it can be good for colony buildup. It might be a good place to split. You may not want to make honey there. You may never want to make honey there, but you may want to make put your splits there, let them grow, and then move them to a late summer uh, location. So healthy bees equals good bees. And, and, and of course, uh, Randy talked about this yesterday. Uh, an older beekeeper told me, if you take care of your bees, they will take care of you. And I believe that. Uh, one of the best things to do to have healthy bees is to have good quality queens. Buy queens from a reputable queen breeder. There's a difference between a queen breeder and a queen producer. And that's not to say that queen producers are bad or they sell bad queens, but you need to ask questions. Ask questions about his stock. Where does he get, it? Where does he get his breeders? Is he buying it from the guy down the road? Does he raise his own? Is he, you know, where does it come from? Does he believe in survivor stock? Personally, I don't buy into the whole survivor stock mantra that a lot of people use. Or, or locally adapted stocks, we can discuss that, that's fine, but, but you, you need to ask him questions that are concerning to you. How often does he treat his bees for mites? Those are things that you need to know. And you need to just, that doesn't mean you have to say, no, I don't want them, but you need to figure out if, the, if what his idea of, of keeping good bees is matches your idea. Maybe you rear your own queens. Maybe you need to improve your uh, queen production system and, and raise higher quality queens. Uh, you need to consider using rush, uh, resistant stock. Uh, I'm part of the Russian Bee Breeders Association, uh, so I believe in Russian bees, but uh, there's VSH bees that are resistant. There are survivor bees that are resistant. Um, so uh, consider using that. Um, uh, so maybe, you, maybe you've been using queens from a certain person and you really like those and you need to know, well, do I really need to change? Well, think about this. Is it difficult to control your mites? Um, are they Russian hybrids? Do you have issues with, with them being a little bit too mean or not very good at controlling mites because they're supposed to be Russians? Maybe they're really hybrids. Uh, are they VSH hybrids? Well, all VSH production queens end up being hybrids. Uh, so you need, you need to check in more find out more about the details on, on where those come from. Uh, do they produce brood all year long? Uh, maybe that works, works for you, uh, maybe not. That just means you gotta feed them more. Because in some areas of the South, you can get brood production nine, 10, uh, 10 11 months out of the year. Uh, have you had trouble with them starving to death in the fall and the spring? Uh, that that could it could be more of a management issue, or it could be more of a, of the the bees want to brood up all the time, and you're just not able to get around to take care of them. So you might want to consider using other stocks. Uh, do they swarm too much? Do they make do they make as much honey as your neighbors? Uh, so those are some things to consider on queens. Uh, good mite control, timely and effective miticides. You cannot kill all the mites in your colony. And it's my personal belief that if you kill more than 80% of the population, you promote resistance. And if you're killing less than 5% of the population, if you're killing less than 20% of the population, um, you're not really, you're not really, you're wasting your miticides. Uh, follow label directions. Timing of the application is very important, but it is also the most difficult thing to do. And that, that 
falls back into the category of 3% and 5%, mite infestation is not a hard and fast rule. Because if you talk to Andy and, and John, they'll tell you, I can't treat when the mites reach a certain level. I have to treat at a certain stage in my business model. You know, you, if you're running 26,000 hives, you can't pull all that honey off, put a mite treatment in, put the boxes back on, and then go pull honey. You gotta wait until you pull the honey off to put your mite treatment in. Uh, effective products. There's, there's, there's several out there now. Oxalic acid is good, formic acid is good, but formic acid's not gonna work for everyone in the South all the time. Um, and your neighbors matter. Proximity to other colonies and common foraging areas affect mite loads. I made this up before I saw Dennis's uh, uh, mite bomb, so. Um, but I, 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 there's some credence to that. Uh, and you need to know what your, what your neighbors are doing. Is he controlling mites? How's he doing? Or maybe he's not controlling them. Okay, this picture here. This is how I, uh, I built this. This is my, white, my mite washing machine. It's pretty crude. Um, this is an ice cream freezer motor. And I took uh, two pieces of plywood and cut, I made a cam. I just could, but, but I could just make half a cam at a time. So I screwed them, overlapped them, screwed them together. It's crude. Um, I have a timer, a light timer. It runs for 30 minutes, shuts off, and runs for 30 more minutes. And this is a this is a beehive lid, got little springs, and so it, you you fill them. With, it's a that's a cup in a cup, and the top cup has screen in the bottom. So you put your bees in there, put your 300 bees, have a cup of bees in there, you dump your alcohol, or you can use soapy water, or water, windshield washer fluid works really well. You dump that in there, you got them all numbered, so have, you keep everything, you get bag number one and goes in, actually it's got hive number 362, goes in cup number 12, hive number 374 goes in cup number six, you gotta keep up with all this stuff. And anyway, you turn it on and it just goes back and forth. It's, it's pretty crude, but it, but it works. And I can do 12, I can wash 12 samples at a time. I can turn it on and go off and leave and do something else. I can come back an hour later and it's turned off and, and all the mites float down below the screen. You, you pick that top cup out and you, 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 you pour them over a cheesecloth or pour them on a, so anyway, you can count the mites. Figure out what works for you. Um, resistant stock, okay. I, like I said, I, I can't do a, can't talk about this without mentioning the Russian bees. Russian bees are resistant to mites. They're not mite proof. They will require some treatments. Uh, we, my dad's operation uses uh, thymol two times a year, and that, that seems to do well. Some commercial guys are treating six times a year. Um, hybrids or crosses with Russians are not as effective as the pure stock, and the pure stock is difficult to obtain because there's a lack of, of people that sell a pure Russian queens. That's just the facts. Uh, VSHBs, are, they are resistant to mites. However, you, the queens that you end up with are a cross between your operation, whatever's in your operation, and the VSH breeder queen that you get. And, uh, and the resistance is based on single VSH trait. And what you end up with depends on how much of that VSH trait you have in your own stock. So there's a lot of variability uh, from one operation to the next operation. Uh, with the, with uh, VSH queens, but but they are good, and you if you work at it, you can you can get good good resistant bees out of it. Um, I don't believe that mites themselves are the biggest problem. I believe it's the viruses that they vector that causes problems. Um, Susan Kegley from Pesticide Research Institute has some research data that she's been working on for a couple of years, and it indicates that um, high mite numbers are not to, are not directly associated with high deaths. So hives that have had high mite numbers are not the ones that die necessarily. And the ones that die, sometimes die even with low mite numbers. So it's more like viruses, whatever's causing the queen to fail, whether that's fungicides, whether it's insect growth regulators, whether it's insecticides, whether it's herbicides, whether it's uh, cell phone towers, I don't know what it is. Um, but it's, it's, it's not directly re related to mites anymore. Yes, ma'am. No, it is done uh, for beekeepers. They go from, two of them go from California to Minnesota. Uh, one of them goes from California to South Dakota. I'm not sure where the other one is. So they're migratory bee operations that go from, they do the almonds and they do up in the Midwest. 
Nutrition. Nutrition is important. Choosing good locations will help mitigate some of that problem. They should typically provide a wide range of, of and a variety of forage. Uh, nutrition deficiencies will reduce the immune system of the bee, and therefore you have uh, problems that wouldn't, things that wouldn't cause a problem then crop up and, and become issues, uh, like hive death, queen failure, I don't know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, I've been doing, I've, I've, my dad started keeping bees when I was two, and there's a whole lot that I still don't know about this. Uh, supplemental pollen, feed that when necessary. I have very, like I said, I have very little experience of feeding pollen patties. I haven't had a lot of success. I don't know if it has something to do with the Russian bees or the fact that I live in an area where I get a lot of natural pollen. Uh, there's, there's, we have a dearth in the summer and there's virtually nothing uh, and that's pretty tough. But the rest of the year when these guys are talking about feeding pollen patties and I'm not, I'm not doing the same thing they're doing. So, so that I don't have a lot of experience with them. But what I do have experience with is I've planted buckwheat in the summer and if you, can, if, you're, if you can be a decent farmer and get it planted right and get rain, buckwheat will help in, in my area when there's not a lot of pollen, natural pollen coming on. And then fall, uh, planted around August, no, September, October, I can get rapini mustard growing in, in through the winter and it's great for the bees. Um, yeah, see, I have a, uh, we have a dearth that lasts for three months in the summer. It starts about the middle of June and goes all the way through uh, almost the first of October. Um, so I have a video of my mustard. Uh, it's covered with bees. Well, that's a shame. It's not going to work. The time not available. Okay. Uh, if I five weeks, okay. If I plant it, no, I guess not. It's not the wrong kind of program, I guess. Chris says quick time not available. Yeah. Um, I planted it in it's just quick time not available, so. Okay. Uh, if I plant it in September, it's blooming by Thanksgiving, and it'll bloom all the way through into January, where I live. If it doesn't freeze, if it doesn't turn 17 degrees for a couple of nights, it'll do fine. Uh, so. Um, Match the next thing is to match the bee population to the honey bloom, to the plant bloom. No bees, no honey. No honey, no money. And while we're all beekeepers and we all are, and honey producers, the real goal is to make honey, make money. That's the real goal. I mean, I told somebody one time, I'm in the money making business. I just use honey to do it, and you're doing it some other way. So, how many bees are needed to make a honey crop? Does anybody know? Need all of them, every single bee. <laughs> It's usually around 60 to 80,000 workers. So how long does it take to get 60,000 workers? Well, if the queen can lay 2,000 eggs a day, and they don't eat them back like they do sometimes, and if you start with six to eight pounds of bees, and you have a good spring, and Mother Nature cooperates, and you don't have a big problem with Varroa, or your, any other issues, it's gonna take like 30 days. And then you need to wait for the that last brood cycle to mature, which is another 12 to 14 days. And if, if your queen's a little bit, if she's not a good quality queen and she's only laying 1,500 eggs a day, it's gonna take you 40 days. So it's gonna take you somewhere between 42 and 54 days. Randy said 60 days, uh, pretty much six weeks. You can just bet on six weeks. It's gonna take you to reach maximum bloom. So you need to know, you, can, you need to look at your frost line, your freeze data and your zones and you, need, and you need to know when that plant's gonna bloom, when your major plant's gonna bloom, and you need, you need to be making your splits or getting your hives ready six weeks ahead of time to do that. So in Mississippi, in South Mississippi, we have, the first bloom starts around April 10th, April 15th. So I've gotta make splits on March the 4th to have be ready for that bloom. If you've got it, if it's May the 10th, 
It's going to make your splits on March the 29th. If it happens to be June 1st, you got to do it on April 20th. Now, you can't make all your splits in one day. If you've got 10 hives, maybe. If you've got 50 hives, you've got 100 hives, you've got 20,000 hives, you can't make all your splits in one day. So you've got to figure that in as to how long it's going to take you to make them, when you're going to start. The first ones used to start making a little bit early so that the last ones are done just a little bit late because it doesn't really matter at most of these bee management things. It doesn't really matter when you start the process. What matters is when you finish. So you got to figure that in. You know, how long? How, many, how long is it going to take you to make splits? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll make all my own. Raise all my own. I either. Yes. Yeah. I uh, for 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 queen production, I can graft somewhere between February 14th and February the 20th is when I make my first graft. Uh, that and makes the most experience. Yeah. A couple, some years that's a little bit like, some years I gotta wait. Like this year, I didn't make my first graft until about the 25th of February. Cause it was a little bit, spring was kind of crazy, this early spring. But I, I have never been able to make them before February 14th. No, these are no, these are with queen cells. These are with queen cells. Yeah. So, if you're gonna figure out it takes six weeks for my bees to get up to maximum honey production size, you kind of need to know how many frames, how many bees you're gonna get on a frame of brood. So I've always kind of been told that one frame of brood of seal brood is gonna equal to three frames of bees. Um, once the queens. Once a queen's laid for three weeks, you should have eight bees of all ages. You should have about 15 to 20, 10, I can even read my own notes, 12 to 15% eggs, 30% uncapped brood, and 50 to 60% capped brood. If you look in your hive and you've got something really way out of whack, if you've got 30% eggs or you got 80% uh, capped brood, then something's going on in your hive. You need to figure out what's going on. Um, there's about, there's approximately 20 cells per square inch on each side of the comb. Uh, a deep frame, it's got, there's about 128 square inches on each side, so you get about 250 square inches of, uh, of brood. Uh, as if it's a solid frame of brood, you're gonna have 5,000 cells per side, so if you've got 10,000 cells for the frame, well that's gonna be about three pounds of bees. Um, you need to start a three, a, a three frame split, starting out it's gonna have somewhere between eight to 10 pounds of bees. So if you're looking in your hive and you, you can estimate, th this will help you estimate how fast your hives are gonna grow. So if you've got, if you only have four frames with brood on them and they're only three quarters full of sealed brood, then you're not gonna quite reach this, this number. You're gonna be a little short of that. So my dad's migratory operation, this is the way they do it. In the, and, and this is the way guys like John, the, the Keep, the, keep bees up in the north, move them south. So um, in the fall and October, they move bees from their summer locations down south. Um, they split bees somewhere around the second week in March, somewhere around the 10th, 15th. Um, they use queen cells, mate their queens, grow their bees, and they put their bees out on uh, what are close to these secondary honey uh, plants. They don't want the major honey plants because the bees will plug up and you'll end up with a box full of you'll end up with a box of honey, or you'll get poor mating success. Um, but they use these secondary plants to grow their bees. They move the bees north in May to take advantage of secondary spring plants up in the northern climates. Uh, the one I always hear about is dandelion, but I heard yesterday that dandelion pollen is not good, so I'm not sure what else is going on at the time. Uh, I think sugar water happens a lot up there, uh, which is that's fine. That's good. Um, if you want to do, if, if you're not willing to travel 1,600 miles, you want to do a short migration, like for Mississippi, it's, you can go two, 300 miles north, uh, and this is what my dad does. You make splits same time in Wiggins, and then we take them up to the Delta, which is about a uh, three, 400 miles, uh, that's about a 300 mile move north. They, uh, they fill their second story. Uh, sometimes you got to feed them on the spring stuff and then they start making honey late June, early July, and you start putting honey supers on them. 